to help this, it's clear that some early intervention is crucial. Experience from New York and other American cities proves that early diagnosis and intervention are of vital importance in preventing the spread of disorder. We would intervene early to tackle antisocial behaviour, building into our strategies support for community and voluntary sector groups that can have a hugely positive role to play in re-engaging young offenders, some of whom we've seen have become completely alienated from the society around them. And this would involve scrapping unnecessary schemes like that contact point database I just talked about and reforming the use of some of the more uh, intrusive databases as, for example, removing the innocent from the DNA database. But looking around modern Britain with open eyes, it's clear that even the best broken window style policing combined with extra help for childhood and all the current panoply of measures to reduce inequality may be necessary but it's not sufficient. If we actually want a long-term sustainable improvement in the lives of families and communities, we need a proper civil society. And this is where my thoughts become counterintuitive for those wedded to the conventional wisdom. Because civil society on the ground, particularly in those difficult <coughs> states, cannot exist unless the individuals there are full citizens. And what does that entail? It means that you need to restore trust between the people themselves, as well as between individuals and the state. The difficult part of this, the part that runs counter to a conventional wisdom, is that they cannot demonstrate this trust unless they <coughs> themselves have the freedom to express it. If you need CCTV to protect you from your neighbour or her children, then the CCTV may give you some short-term relief, except when it's smashed or no one's monitoring it, but it will not provide any long-term confidence that your streets or your tower block are safe. That only comes when, to use an old-fashioned working class phrase, everyone is looking out for everyone else. And if we are asked to start treating people as full citizens with a full range of civil liberties, including the right not to be spied on, the right not to be put on a database on the off chance, not to be constantly supervised by the state's enforcement mechanisms, we, and they need a bonding framework. Successful communities have this, as do successful societies. It derives from a sense of mutual responsibility, which can only be exercised as a matter of free choice. Of course, you can penalise someone for dropping litter if you're prepared to pay for a warden to stand on every street corner 24 hours a day, but you can't force them to think when they leave their front door, what can I do to improve this area? rather than, I don't care, I'll just trash it. Since only truly free people can exercise responsibilities, we should ask which freedoms particularly contribute to this instilling of civic responsibility. And I believe it's the freedom to make decisions about the vital local services which are at the heart of any local community. David Cameron has said that where Labour think that an individual's identity consists in being recognised, registered and assisted by the state, Conservatives think that identity is derived through membership in society. Labour thinks that social justice means equality achieved and guaranteed by government. We think it means community built and maintained by people themselves. For example, the ability to exercise some control over your local school or at the very least to choose whether the school is suitable for your child, is key. Michael Gove's proposal to open up the school network to new entrants is therefore not just an educational step forward, though it will be a huge educational step forward, but a contribution to this freedom and the consequent civic responsibility. Similarly, I think we should give more power to local communities to decide on the buildings that they live in and that surround them. Not just the number of houses, but the design priorities of the estate. The rat runs that we used to build on council estates were never popular with the people that lived there, just with the architects that designed them. Nor was the idea, that must have seemed a good idea uh, in somebody's peaceful Georgian terrace, of parking cars out of sight so they didn't get in the way of the view. It just meant they were free to be vandalised all the time. The people who run, who live in an area, can best be trusted to run their own children's leisure facilities. They really care about them. They should be enabled as well to have a much greater input into local policing priorities. 
Now, the argument against all this, uh, which is never quite put explicitly in public, is that this level of freedom and lack of control is impossible for poor people. It's regarded as too risky. If we respond to the breakdown in society that has happened in some parts of the country with a reduction in state <coughs> control, the argument goes, surely the result will be that the criminal will simply prey ever more easily on the respectable. I think we must challenge this outlook, not just because it's patronising and insulting, but also because it's a counsel of despair. If we start from the presumption that a significant percentage of our fellow citizens are permanently incapable of exercising full civic rights, then we will never live in a stable and relaxed country. Instead, we should look, we should turn ourselves up by looking at some of the institutions which benefit from attracting people from this background. Sadly, there are no reliable figures available about the socio-economic background of those who join the army, but it's perfectly clear to anyone who knows them that a large number of the brave men and women on the front line come from very disadvantaged backgrounds, as they always have done throughout our history. This means that some of the most self-disciplined people in the country whose life's work involves looking out for others as well as themselves, were brought up in the areas that were in danger of lazily assuming contain none of these virtues. And we should also look back through history. The workers' education associations were, sadly for a conservative like me, seen as part of the rise of the Labour Party. But the desire of those who would otherwise find their chances in life restricted to haul themselves up through education was admirable then and would be the same now. And I feel this very personally. It's my own family, were a classic Welsh working class. My parents knew that education was the way out of a constricted vision of life. Some of my family became teachers, but all of them knew that you can take control of your own life if you're prepared to work at it. And that's the same driving force that motivated many ethnic minority communities when they first arrived in this country. There is a wrong-headed and insulting view that poor people are poor because they are feckless. Some are, just like some very affluent people are, but the vast majority aren't. Now, it may seem that I've drifted away from arguments about civil liberties, but I base my contention that civil liberties are essential for the most disadvantaged on the proposition that they should not be treated differently from the comfortable and affluent. One nation should mean one set of rules for all and one set of rights for all. There is indeed such a thing as society, and it's not the same as the state. And as well as that proposition, I would argue the need for personal and community empowerment. What we need is to help the formation of self-run bodies by independent people. The best and most effective policing is self-policing. Problems like vandalism and graffiti, which so enrage people, are most likely to be minimised if the buildings, the flower beds, the very streets feel as though they belong to the whole local community. If your children <coughs> have planted the bulbs or painted the community centre, they are a lot less likely to damage them in a fit of bored rebellion. We are, you may have noticed, about to have an election. At this election, voters will have a choice. I hope they will vote for change. And one big change we need is to set the people free, to trust the people, in that grand old Tory phrase, which should still be a guiding light to us. I know this sounds risky and over-optimistic, but what's the alternative? More and more control? Increasing public spending to hold down an underclass we've written off? This would be both expensive and dehumanising. And in the long run, it would also be a failure. You can't run a modern democratic country in which your civil liberties depend on where you live, what you earn, and where your children go to school. Civil liberties are the liberties of every citizen, from the richest to the poorest. We should defend and enhance them for everyone. Thank you.